Good morning, dear students. Uh, my name is Farhan Mazar, and today is fourth of March, two thousand and twenty-two. Right now, I am with the eleven Cambridge class, and the subject we are studying is Cambridge O Levels Physics five zero five four. We are practicing the past papers, and today we are working on a theory paper. We call it paper two, and we have selected October November two thousand sixteen two two paper. this paper belongs from the zone 2 or you can say this paper belongs from the variant 2 today in this session in this video we will solve only the section a of this paper the section b of this paper we will solve in another video in another in another session so let's start today's paper so the first first of all let's have a look at the question paper so here we go so we are working on october november 2016 a two two paper theory paper 1 hour 45 minutes are allowed and let's start the section a okay so on your screen the section a is showing us a skier sets off from rest and accelerates uniformly at 3.4 meter per second square in a straight line for 5 seconds calculate the speed of the skier after 5 seconds so we know the acceleration uniform acceleration 3.4 meter per second square we know the time taken we know that the initial velocity is zero and the question is what is the final velocity if you remember the formula for the acceleration uh, that's a equals to v minus u divided by t we can find the value of the v the u initial velocity is zero the final velocity is question so let me show you how i have done this on a paper so here we go so the initial velocity is zero the final velocity is question the acceleration is 3.4 meter per second square the time is 5 seconds so we will apply the formula v minus u divided by t equals to a So v minus zero divided by five equals to three point four. So v equals to three point four multiply five. So v will be seventeen meter per second. Seventeen meter per second. So let's have a look at the marking scheme. So the marking scheme for question number one. Okay, so seventeen meter per second is the right answer. Okay, so let's go to the next question. at 5 seconds the skier stops accelerating and travels on for a further 10 seconds at a constant speed state the size of the resultant force acting on the skier during these 10 seconds because in these 10 seconds he is moving at a constant speed so when you move at a constant speed your acceleration is zero so the resultant force is also zero so that we have to state here only the resultant force will be zero so let me show you my answer resultant force will be zero so let's have a look at the marking scheme the question number b first part zero or zero or no resultant force okay so let's move to the next part he says on the figure 1.1 sketch a speed time graph for the skier during the whole 15 seconds so in the first 5 seconds he accelerated uniformly and for his speed went from 0 to 17 in 5 seconds so the uniform acceleration on a speed time graph is represented with a a straight line uh, with a constant gradient inclined straight line with a constant gradient and the constant speed is represented with a horizontal line on the speed time graph so let me show you i have done this okay so in the 5 seconds okay so first of all look at this graph on the y axis the speed is represented the scale is very simple and on the x axis the time is represented the time is in seconds but the 10 small squares represents 4 it means that one small square represents if you divide uh, the the means uh, 10 with the 
you get 2.5. So it means 2.5 small squares that represents one. So for the five seconds, that's why from the four, I went 2.5 small squares uh, towards the right. And there I put a dot for the 17. So put a dot here, put a dot here, join them with a straight line. That shows a uniform acceleration. From here till uh, this 15, I will draw a straight line. So this is how you draw this speed time graph. The x-axis scale is little difficult. So look at it very carefully. So let me show you the marking scheme. So have a good look at the marking scheme. Our graph is perfectly fine. Okay, so let's move to the next part. He says, state how the distance traveled by the sphere can be determined using the speed time graph. If you want to find out the speed time graph, uh, from the speed time graph, if you want to find out the distance traveled, you need to find out the area under the speed time graph. So the area under the speed time graph is equals to the distance traveled. Let me show you my answer. So the area under the speed time graph is equals to the distance traveled. So that's how you do this. So let me show you the marking scheme. Calculate the area under this graph or area of the trapezium. So that was the question number one. So let's move to the next question. So the next question coming up on your screen. A skateboarder of mass 45 kg is at the top of a ramp. Figure 2.1 shows the skateboarder and the ramp. The skateboarder moves off and she descends vertically through 1.8 meter. The gravitational field strength G is 10 Newton per kg. Calculate the change in gravitational potential energy of the skateboarder. So the change in the gravitational potential energy can be calculated. The formula is very simple, MGH. We know the mass of the skateboarder, that is uh, 45 kg. And we know the G value, that's 10 Newton per kg. And we know the vertical height, of the drop that's 1.8 meter. So just put these values in that formula and you will be able to find out the loss in the gravitational potential energy. That will be, this is how you calculate it. MGH, 45 kg multiply 10 Newton per kg multiply 1.8 meter. So you get 8, 10 joules, 8, 10 joules. So let me show you the marking scheme. I hope you understand this numerical. So the answer is eight, 10 joules, and our answer is perfect. Okay, so let's move to the next part. He says, state, state the name of the two forms of energy that increase as she descends. As she comes down the ramp, uh, the kinetic energy increases. The thumb, when she overcomes the friction between the ramp and uh, the tire, the thermal energy is given out. So thermal energy increases. So these are the two energies which will be increased. Uh, there will be sound produced, so the sound energy will increase. So let me show you my answer. So the kinetic energy will increase and the thermal energy will increase. The sound energy will increase. So let me show you the marking scheme. Is it the kinetic energy, kinetic either order, thermal, internal, heat, sound? So our answers are right. Okay, so let's move to the next question. At the lowest point on the ramp, the skateboarder is traveling at a constant speed along a path which is part of a vertical circle. State the direction of the resultant force on the skateboarder at this point. So when the skateboarder will come down, it's, it's moving in this circular track. It's a vertical, it's a vertical scale. So when it will be here, uh, there will be a centripetal force. Uh, there will be a resultant force which will be towards the center of this vertical circle. This is a circle in which it's traveling. So here, the direction of the resultant force will be towards the center of this vertical circle. So let's listen to this question's wording again. The direction of the resultant force on the skateboarder at this point. The, the resultant force when you're moving in a circle track is always towards the center of that circle. So center of that, that circle. Then he says how the weight of the skateboarder compares with the upward force that the ramp exerts on her. The, the, the force which is exerted by the ramp on the skateboarder will be towards the center of the circle. 
So that force is larger than the weight. Okay, so let me show you the my answers. So the resultant force will be towards the center of the vertical circle. Upward contact force is greater than the weight. So here we go. So let's have a look at the marketing scheme. So question number two, B, first part, second part, the, both the answers are showing up on your screen. Our answers are right. Okay, so let's move to the next question. The next question coming up on your screen. When the lid of a freezer is open, it pivots about the hinge at the back of the freezer. The handle is at the front. Figure 3.1 is a side view of the freezer. So here is that freezer. This is the hinge. This is the door of, the, of that freezer, which, move, which opens upward. The handle is uh, 0.7 meter from the hinge. The lid has a mass of 2 kg. The gravitational field strength G is 10 Newton per kg. Calculate the weight of the lid. The weight of the lid is, the formula is very simple, W equals to mg. W equals to mg. We know the mass of the lid, that's 2 kg. And the G value is 10 Newton per kg. Just put the values in that formula. You will be able to find out the weight. So here we go. W is equals to mg. So 2 multiplied 10, that will be 20 Newton. 20 Newton. So let's have a look at the marking scheme. So 20 Newton is the right answer, sir. Okay. So then they say the lid is uniform and its center of mass is at its center, the weight of the lid produces a moment about the hinge. Calculate the moment about the hinge when the lid is closed. Okay, so when the lid will be closed, the center of the gravity will be here. Here, the weight of the door will be acting. So that will be 20 Newton. And its distance, its moment arm, its perpendicular distance uh, from the pivot will be 0.35 meter because the total lid is its length is 0.7 meter its half length will be 0.35 meter so its moment arm the distance between the lid and the center of the gravity that will be 0.3 meter so i can calculate the moment produced the moment produced is the uh, you can say anti clockwise and it will be the weight multiply the distance of the center of gravity from the hinge so let me show you how I have written this. Okay, so the moment is equal to the weight multiply the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the weight and the pivot. So 20 Newton multiplies 0.35 meter. So your final answer will be 7 Newton meter. 7 Newton meter. So let's have a look, a look at the marking scheme. What the marking scheme says, oh, the marking scheme says, seven newton meter i said per meter is newton meter sorry a newton meter yes i have written right but i said something wrong okay so the second part is the moment required to open the lid is greater than the value calculated in the a second first part so just one reason so when you try to open the lid the force required will be more because there might be friction in the hinge so you have to provide the force to overcome that friction also so let's have a look at the marking scheme. He says the friction at the hinge seal or air resistance or to cause an initial acceleration. So let me show you the marking scheme, my written answer. So there might be friction in the hinge. Okay, so let's have a look at the marking scheme. Okay, so the marking scheme says uh, friction at hinge seal or air resistance or to cause an initial acceleration so let's move to the next question the next part i mean it says the <clears throat> he says the lid is closed to open the lid a force f is applied to the handle as shown in the figure 3.1 
The direction of the F is vertically upwards and F is the smallest possible force that opens the lid. A force on the handle in any other direction must be larger than the F in order to open the lid. Explain why. It's a one mark question. So when the lid is closed, so you apply the force at this handle in this direction. In this position and in this direction of the force, the, the moment arm will be largest, okay? So if you apply force other than this direction, for example, if you apply force like this, then the moment arm will become smaller. So with the same force applied, and because the moment arm will be smaller, the, uh, the moment produced will be less. So because the moment arm will become smaller if you change the direction of the So let me read the answer. F is vertically upward, moment arm will be largest. When the F is vertically upwards, moment arm will be largest. F in any other direction will have smaller moment arm. To produce same moment, a larger force will be required. If the moment arm will become smaller, to produce the same force, you have to provide uh, with uh, to produce the same moment, you have to produce uh, you have to provide with a larger force. So uh, let's have a look at the marking scheme. He says for other directions, perpendicular distance is less. Okay, so that was question number three. So let's move to the next question. The next question coming up on your screen is question number uh, four. Uh, figure 4.1 shows a kettle containing water placed on the burner of a gas cooker. The gas burner is lit at the time T equals to zero. At T equals to 250 seconds, the temperature of the water is 100 degrees centigrade. The boiling point of the water. State what is meant by boiling point. You see, the boiling point is basically a temperature at which a liquid will start boiling. Boiling point is a temperature at which a liquid will start boiling. It will start converting from the liquid state into the gaseous state and the temperature will not change. So that's the definition for the boiling point. Okay, so the next question is question number one. Uh, let me show you the marking scheme. Uh, Temperature at which the liquid water turns to gas, vapor, or steam. Okay. The figure 4.2 shows how the temperature of the water changes with time, T. Okay. So here on the x-axis, the time is represented. On the y-axis, the temperature is represented. When the time is zero, the temperature is 20 I think 25 and when the, uh, sorry, this is 20 to uh, 20 divided by five, it will be four. So 24, the initial temperature is 24. The final temperature will be 100. So there is a change of the temperature. He says the kettle, the kettle contains 1.5 kg of water, which has a specific heat capacity of 4,200 joules per kg per degree centigrade. Using the figure 4.2, determine the increase in the internal energy of the water between T0 and T250. So at T0, the temperature is 24. And at 250, the temperature is something like, I think, 100. Yeah, it looks like 100. So the T1 equals to 24, uh, 24 degrees centigrade. The T2 is 100 degrees centigrade. So the change in the temperature will be 100 minus 24, and that will be 76 degrees centigrade. Heat is equal to MC delta. 
delta theta. So 1.5 multiply. So that will be 4.8 expo 5 joules. So let, let me check the answer. So 4.8. 4.8 uh, export 10 raised to the power 5. So that is that is our right answer. So let's go back to the question. The next question is, In thermal energy, heat is transferred to the water at a constant rate, but the temperature of the water increases as at a rate that is not constant, as shown in the figure 4.2. Explain why the temperature increases in this way. You see, uh, when you give heat, the temperature of the water increases. As the temperature of the water rises, the heat loss from the water increases. For example, the rate of evaporation will become larger when the temperature of the water rises. So at a higher temperature, the rate of evaporation increases. So that, that increases the heat loss from the water. So that's why the rate with which the temperature is rising is not constant. Okay, so let me show you the marking scheme. So as the temperature of water increases, the heat loss by evaporation increases because the rate of evaporation increases. So rate of increase of the temperature of the water decreases. So let's have a look at the marking scheme. So the heat is lost uh, to the surrounding or evaporation at higher temperature. Heat is lost at a greater rate. Okay. When the temperature reaches 100 degrees centigrade, the kettle is the kettle is left on the burner. Thermal energy is still supplied to the water. The water boils as the molecules from form bubbles and rises to the surface. State what happens to the temperature of the water. You see, when the boiling is taking place, the temperature of the water will not change. It will remain constant. So let me show you my answer. So the temperature of the water will remain constant. Okay, so let's look at the marking scheme. Stays at the 100 degrees centigrade is constant, okay. Explain in terms of molecules why it is necessary to supply thermal energy in order to keep the water boiling. You see, when the process of boiling starts, the amount of heat which you give is used to overcome the intermolecular forces, to overcome the intermolecular uh, bond, to, to break the intermolecular bonds completely, to move to move the molecules away from each other. So uh, you need these, uh, you need the, to, to, to do these works, you need energy. And so no energy is used to increase the kinetic energy. All the energy which you provide is used to break the intermolecular bonds, overcome the intermolecular forces, and to move the molecules away from each other. So let me show you the marking scheme. Molecules separate are pulled apart, are far apart, break bonds, overcome force of attraction, work done separating the molecules or molecules gain potential energy. So, energy is needed to break intermolecular bonds completely, more move molecules away from each other, overcome forces due to the atmospheric pressure on the surface of the water or the liquid. So that was question number four. Question number five, gas is trapped in a syringe by a piston. Figure 5.1 shows the narrow end of the syringe is sealed. So when the gas is at a pressure of 1.1 expo 5 Pascal, it occupies a volume of 40 centimeter cube. So the P1 is 1.1 expo 5 Pascal and the V1 is 40 centimeter cube. Explain in the terms of the molecules 
how the gas exerts a pressure on the inside of the string. You see the gas molecules, they are moving randomly. And during their random motion, they collide with the walls of the syringe. So when they collide with the wall of the syringe, they exert force on the walls of the syringe. So the unit, uh, the force per unit area is known as the pressure. It's a three mark question. So let me show you my answer and then we can move to the next part. So gas molecules move randomly. During their motion, they collide with the walls of syringe. On collision, they exert force on the walls of the syringe. Force per unit area is pressure of the gas inside the syringe. So this is how you write this answer. So let me check. Molecules separate or pulled apart are far apart. Break bonds, overcome force of traction, work done separating the molecules or molecules gain potential energy. The question number five, and it's A part. It says atoms, molecules, particles move, collide. Atoms, molecules, particles collide with walls, piston, and collision causes forces. Okay. So that was the question number four, as uh, five, sorry. And it's A part. Question five, it's A part. Now we are on the question number five, it's B part. The piston is slowly pulled to the right until the volume occupied by the gas is 110 centimeter cube. The temperature of the gas does not change. Calculate the new pressure of the gas. Okay. So we know the P1, V1. Okay, let me show you. So the P1, V1 equals to P2, V2. So the P1 is 1.1 X per 5 Pascal, and the V1 is 40 centimeter cube. The P2 is question, the V2 is 110 centimeter cube. So if you make the P2 alone, that 40 will, 1.1 uh, X per 5 multiply 40 divided 110, so your final answer will be 4 expo 4 Pascal. 4 expo 4 Pascal. So that was the question number five. In a cathode ray oscilloscope, a beam of electrons is produced by a filament at one end of an evacuated glass tube. The electrons are then accelerated and strike a screen at the other end of the tube. Describe how the electrons are produced by the filament and how they are then accelerated. You see, we have a cathode there and that cathode is heated. So when that cathode is heated by the process of thermionic emission, the electrons come out of that cathode into the air. So we place an anode there, and that anode is, at a, is positive, and it is at a very high voltage. So the negative electrons, which came out of the thermonic emission, and these, this anode, positive anode, attract each other. So the electrons will start moving towards the, uh, towards the anode, which is at a very high voltage. So let me read you uh, my answer, my written answer. A cathode is heated due to thermal energy. Electrons from cathode come out of cathode into air. This is called thermionic emission. An anode at very high voltage is placed in from a, in, inside uh, the cathode. It attracts the negative electrons towards itself. Electrons will accelerate. So you have put an anode there, which is positively charged. So uh, this word is wrong. Let me show you. So this is a call thermonic emission. And uh, he says, an anode at very high voltage is placed in 
So here it is in front, in front. You have to write in front. In front of the cathode, it attracts the negative electrons towards itself. Electrons will accelerate. So, So we are done with this. He says, explain why the glass tube is evacuated. You see this cathode ray oscilloscope, the glass tube is evacuated. So we remove all the air. If the air is present inside the glass tube, the electrons will not be able to travel and they will not be able to reach the screen. So let me check the answer. So no collisions with the air particles or allows electrons to reach the screen. So that's it, the answer. Question number six, B part. C part. The instruction booklet for the ACR, uh, CRO states that the strong magnets must not be placed close to the CRO. Explain why a strong magnet close to the CRO deflects the electron beam. You see the electrons are negatively charged and they are moving in the CRO. If you will have a magnetic field near the CRO, the electrons will be deflected because they are charged particles and they are moving. And if there is electric field, so they will experience a force on them and they will be deflected. So once they are deflected, the display on the, on the CRO screen will be distorted. So that is the question number six C part. Let me read my answer. If air is present, electrons will collide with the air molecules and electrons will be stopped. Beam of electrons will not be formed. If a strong magnet is placed near a CRO, electrons being negatively charged will experience a force when they, they will move in the magnetic field. They will be deflected, so display on the screen of the CRO will be distorted. So if the, if the negative electrons they experience a magnetic field, so they will be deflected. So no beam of electron will be formed and the display on the CRO screen will be distorted. Okay, so let's 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 have a marking scheme. So deflected by a magnetic field or experience force in the magnetic field. Okay, so we are good. Okay, so next is the question number seven. He says. The plutonium-238 is a radioactive isotope that decays by alpha particle emission. It also emits gamma rays. The nuclide notation for the plutonium-238 is plutonium-94-238. Describe the structure and composition of a neutral atom of the plutonium-238. So the plutonium-94-238 will have 94 uh you can say protons and 238 minus 94 will be the electron and uh, neutrons and so let let me read my answer first okay so the plutonium 94 238 have 94 protons and 144 neutrons in its nucleus there are 94 electrons orbiting in orbits around the nucleus. Amount of negative and the positive charge is equal. Let's have a look at the marking scheme. Okay, our answer is right. Alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays are rays all cause ionization. The ionization of uh, substances in the human body can be hazardous. State how the ionizing effect of the beta particles 
compares with the ionizing effect of the alpha particles. The ionizing effect of the beta particles is less than the ionizing effect of the alpha particles. Then their question is the ionizing effect of the gamma rays. The ionizing effect of the beta particles is of the uh, of the beta particles is uh, is more than the ionizing effect of the gamma rays. So let me read this answer for you. So there's no confusion. The ionizing effect of the beta particles is less than the ionizing effect of the alpha particles. Ionizing the second part is ionizing effect of the beta particles is more than the ionizing effect of the gamma rays. So that is He says, uh, state two precautions that are taken when radioactive substances are moved in a safe way. We always place the radioactive sample in a lead box. That can be one. Uh, we minimize the rate of, uh, you see, we minimize the time of the exposure to the substance. So uh, these are the two, two precautions. Let me read it for you. Place sample in the lead box. Minimize the time of the exposure. These are the two. So, uh, okay. So the marking scheme is showing up on your screen. Question number seven and B and Salas part. So you can read the marking scheme. So we have reached the end. So uh, my dear students, uh, today we have done October, November, 2016, Physics 5054 paper. Today in this session, in this video, we have done the section A of this paper. The section B of this paper, I will solve in another video. So I hope that uh, I am to some help to you. If you think that this video is informative for you, this video is helping you to prepare for your Cambridge exam, Please share uh, the link of this video onto your Facebook account and onto your Instagram account and onto your Twitter. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day and God bless you all.